Welcome. We're glad that you're joining with us for our Bible study on Job. This is the third installment of our study. The first was done on our Sunday morning Bible study on July the 5th. The second one was done and put on the uh, online last weekend. And this is the third installment, chapters 4 through 7 of the book of Job. When we study the book of Job, we understand that suffering is indiscriminate. That is, it doesn't just happen to bad people, but good people suffer even bad things. One of the questions, the silver bullet, so to speak, that infidels or unbelievers will say is that if God is all-powerful and if God is all-good, then he should protect the righteous and not allow them to suffer. Question, how many of you have ever scheduled an appointment with the dentist? Now, no offense to any of the dentists. I, I love them. I appreciate the work. But I've never scheduled an appointment with the dentist where I thought, oh, well, there's a guarantee that I won't have any discomfort during the cleaning and the scraping and the, the setting right of whatever might be wrong uh, in my mouth. And so understanding that I've scheduled dentist appointments willingly, I, I did it for my own health. Sometimes when we suffer or experience pain, it's not all bad. It's not everything against us. Job experienced horrific loss, terrible pain, and the loss of all of his, his belongings, his wealth, his possessions, and then also with his seven sons and three daughters being killed. We see Job suffering. This was because Satan was trying to put a test. There was a temptation during this trial that Job was facing. What unbelievers miss is that when we look at suffering, we have to put right in the center of that discussion who God is. Do I know God? Do I understand God's purpose for my life? It isn't happiness alone. It is holiness. It is a relationship with God. And so in the book of Job, we have an answer. We have reasons that we can give to others to help adjust their thinking, to see life from a different point of view that assists them to be able to put suffering in its proper context. So in Job, as Job loses everything, in chapter 3, his friends come. They sit there for a full seven days without saying anything. And we admire their patience. We admire their wisdom, not just to start speaking. As we talk about these friends, Eliphaz is... The oldest of those, presumably, a Temanite, that is the city of Teman, was known for its wisdom in the ancient world, and therefore Eliphaz is the one who speaks first. If you look at the outline in chapters uh, 4 and 5, Eliphaz is going to speak. He's going to speak first about his experience, that is, what have I learned, the ideas, the conclusions, and then what have I observed, the observation. So let's look at Job chapters 4 and 5, see Eliphaz's first speech. This is in the first cycle of speeches that continues down through chapter 14. So look at chapter 4 of Job with me. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? In other words, I would talk to you, Job, but I'm not sure you're ready or you're able to listen. Oftentimes when people are suffering, it is difficult. I will tell you to, to try to start out by saying, hey, I know exactly how you feel. That's probably the last thing they want to hear because they feel like their feelings, their hurt is very personal. We want to identify with someone. We want to help to empathize, uh, but we are not in their shoes. So we want to come alongside and we want to show support. He continues, but who can withhold himself from speaking? Surely you have instructed many, and you have strengthened many weak hands. Your words have upheld him who is stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. But now it comes upon you, and you are weary. It touches you, and you are troubled. Is not your reverence, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? So Eliphaz looks back. He remembers the former days when Job had, had it all. When Job's life seemed to be all together and he was completely blessed is how others would have uh, seen Job. And then it is that Eliphaz takes from this fear of God, that is the reverence, the integrity that Job had, that God had even commented and asked Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job? His integrity. He's blameless. That is, there's nothing there that is without, uh, no charge that is without some recognition. Job, when he makes a mistake, mistake, he owns it. He confesses it. He comes to me and seeks to, to have a sacrifice and to make that right. That's what the upright represents. Look beginning in verse 7. Here Eliphaz starts with this experience. Here's what I've learned. Here's my wisdom of the ages, my wisdom of man. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish. By the breath of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. If you look at this passage, what Eliphaz is saying is, people suffer for their own mistakes. The wrongs that happen. What he says is, who has ever perished being innocent? Eliphaz, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of Abel? When Abel was killed by Cain, was Abel innocent or was Abel guilty? Now, I know Abel wasn't perfect. He was offering a sacrifice, which means he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged his need for forgiveness by the Lord. But Cain killed Abel, not because of what Abel had done that was wrong, but because Abel's worship was acceptable to God. He was jealous. His envy caused him to turn against his own brother and take his life. So Eliphaz, even though he's had this, uh, this experience, he misses the point that, yes, there are people who suffer innocently, at least in that moment or at that particular time, like Job was suffering. Uh, not because he had done something specifically that had caused this. Notice the judgment of God in verse 9, the, the blast of God or the, the blast of his breath. You know, when you think about people getting angry and, and snorting or people getting angry and, and just getting red in the face, this is the picture of the judgment of God that Eliphaz presents. Let me take this moment to encourage you to remember, when we talk about the inspiration of Scripture, we are saying that every word has been accurately recorded. But when people speak, for example, Satan, when Eliphaz is speaking his own words, his own personal wisdom, the inspiration of Scripture is that those words have been preserved accurately. It does not mean that every word that Eliphaz speaks is what God would tell us. It is the reasoning process that we see of Job's friends that is very instructive. But if we come back to the book of Job and we just quote any old scripture out of its context, we may not properly represent what scripture teaches. So when you go to the speeches of Job's friends throughout the book of Job, what you're hearing is the common everyday wisdom of people. What you hear from the end of the book is what God puts back by saying you have to start with, you have to remember at all times who God is. What's God's purpose? So this helps us. Notice in verses 10 and 11, five times there are words here, different words in the Hebrew language for lions. We look at lions as being ferocious, dangerous. Uh, they are predators. They're looking for their prey. Uh, they are meat eaters. And so lions have that, that sense that causes us to be uh, struck with fear. And so as Eliphaz reasons, he's talking this, trying to talk about how this has struck fear into Job uh, about getting his life right with God. Uh, down in verses 12 uh, to um, the 21, he, he speaks as from a spirit. Again, there's been a voice, and later we'll see that that voice is, there is a message from God, the patriarchal age. God spoke to the fathers, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. So we realize that this is what Eliphaz is claiming, is that there is a message that God has given. But again, Eliphaz seems to still be trying to understand and refine 
that message. Now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. In disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair on my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth, they are broken in pieces from morning till evening. They perish forever with no one regarding. Does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. So again, in this, Eliphaz is speaking about mortality. He's comparing to God, the maker, uh, as far as his purity. But again, has Eliphaz properly taken the message of God, the image of God, and applied it to this situation? And, and we would say no. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25, Anxiety in the heart causes depression of man, but a kind word or a good word cheers him up. And so again, Eliphaz, he wants to be a friend to Job. He claims to be a friend, but his word is actually causing uh, more depression, uh, more anxiety within Job. Uh, certainly, the scripture understands that there is, if we, we sow uh, trouble, we're going to reap trouble. But not everything that happens that's difficult or hurtful or painful, not, not all suffering, is purely because of our own individual trouble. When Paul preached before Festus and Agrippa in Acts 26, Festus at one point speaks out as Paul is talking about the mission that God gave him and that he's, he's certainly been obedient to that heavenly vision. Festus cries out and he said, Paul, much learning has made you mad. In other words, you've lost your mind. Sometimes we look at people and they can be very educated. They can be very wise in worldly ways, but it doesn't mean that their wisdom is truly or properly aligned with God's truth. So we need to be able to continue. Eliphaz continues. Now he goes to the fact that it's not just his experience, but even his observation. In other words, I've been watching through life. This is what life has taught me. This is what I have observed. So he's trying to bring these two together. Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate, and there is no deliverer. So as Eliphaz has watched, he has watched people who were sinners suffer for that. And he says, you know, I've, I've seen that, that that's pretty certain. People that are doing bad things... There is a natural accountability that will catch up with them. Uh, how many, you know, have been taught about lies? Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Lies will come out. The truth will come out. It is going to reveal itself. Notice in verse 7, Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Again, so many times, like the natural process, whether it's gravity or whether it's sparks flying up into the uh, air, he says this is the natural thing that happens when people get into trouble. There are consequences. And so Eliphaz says, this is my observation. Uh, if you look down in verses 8 to 16, he is placing the cause before God. But as for me, I would seek God. And to God, I would commit my cause who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. So God, again, rewards. God takes care of things, and they will be accounted for. So down in verse 16, so the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. God, in the end, will settle all accounts. It is that our ultimate accountability is to God. So Eliphaz says, I would lay my cause before God. Well, Job is not afraid to lay his cause before God. And he's going to, as through the book, he is going to continue to lay his cause before the Lord as he did in chapter 3 and seek God's divine help to be able to put these things into place. In verses 17 to 27, 
Happy is the one whom God reproves. In other words, Eliphaz makes the point that if God is the one disciplining you, if God is the one judging you, then you've got to accept it. There's no argument or fighting with God. So verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine he shall redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, and you shall not be afraid of destruction uh, when it comes. He goes on, finally, verse 27, Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know for yourself. So Eliphaz sums it up. How do we know God? Uh, how do we understand? This is what we've learned. God disciplines, and his discipline is for our good. Homer Haley a uh, well-known preacher uh, in Churches of Christ said this. He said, Eliphaz has two flaws in his argument. Number one, it did not apply to Job. In other words, this situation, Eliphaz did not know of a specific sin. He is guessing. He is assuming that Job had a sin. So it didn't apply to Job. Number two, Eliphaz saw only God's physical blessings, not truly considering the spiritual element uh, in this. And so those physical blessings were for physical purposes, uh, for fleshly purposes. When we look at chapters 4 and 5 and we think about Eliphaz, who do you give advice? How do you approach them? Certainly we want to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, but we also want to be able to point people to God. Our God is awesome. Our God loves us. So we want to bring people, as we give advice, we want to help them to come closer to God. So we must avoid making presumptions. And that's where all of Job's friends fall into the trap. They make a presumption based upon what they see as the outcome. But is the story finished? No. God is not done with us yet. God was not finished with Job yet. We come to chapter uh, 6, chapter 6 and 7, and Job makes a reply. And the first thing is, Job appeals to his friends, and listen to how he, how he approaches that. He said, my grief is heavier than I can bear. Uh, it's heavier than the sands of the sea. Imagine the seashore. Sometimes people go out to the, the beach here in Sarasota, and they bury somebody in the sand. Well, let me tell you, if you put somebody under the sand all the way up to their shoulders and just leave their head sticking out, uh, there are times you can't get out of the sand if there's enough weight of the sand on you. Somebody else is going to have to dig you back out uh, of that sand. So Job answers about his grief. Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? Or does the ox low over its fodder? Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are as loathsome food to me. Job is saying, hey, even my food has lost its taste. The grief is so great. Oftentimes, we feel lost. We have to avoid being able to say to someone in that moment, I know how you feel. It just isn't helpful. It, it's not true. And it isn't representative of showing the love that God has. It is better to say, God knows what you're going through. Jesus cares what you're going through. When we help people to draw close to God, drawing into God rather than being pulled away from God is the answer in our suffering. In verses 8 to 13, Job says, I have not denied the Holy One. I have not denied the words that God has given me. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me the thing that I long for, that it would please God to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have comfort, though in anguish I would exult. He will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Job, again, keeps his connection with God, his integrity, his reverence for God. He doesn't sin with his mouth 
or his words uh, in this. Look at verses 14 as he continues here, verses 14 to 23. And he talks about their friendship, but that their words, their actions towards him are deceitful. Verse 14, to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend. Even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty, my brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away, which are dark because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. When it is warm, they cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside. They go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tima, look, the travelers of Sheba, hope for them. They are disappointed because they were confident. They come there and are confused. For now you are nothing. You see terror and are afraid. Did I ever say, bring something to me, or offer a bribe for me from your wealth, or deliver me from the enemy's hand, or redeem me from the hand of oppressors? Again, Job appeals to his friends, and he says, you, you've, you've jumped to a conclusion. You've made a presumption about me that I've said, and that's not what's happened. That's not what's taken place. So he says, you've dealt with me deceitfully. Again, our kindness of words. Eliphaz had started out with some honey. He started out kind of gently, but then he quickly moved into, hey, Job, this has to be on you. Job says, without that knowledge, without my confession, how could you presume? How could you make that uh, conclusion uh, from this? And so Job continues. In verses 24 to 30, basically he says, teach me how I have erred. In other words, what is the point that you have for my sin? Teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forceful are right words, but what does your arguing prove? Do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one, which are as when? Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless, and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now. Let there be no injustice. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? As he concludes here, this word is teach. It's the word, uh, the Hebrew word hefel, which means direct or, or teach or instruct. Show me. Cause me to understand. How do you respond to accusations? How do you respond to poor advice uh, that people may give? In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We want to help each other in that instruction. Quickly in, verse, in chapter 7, the appeal to the Lord. Uh, what Job talks about is his suffering, talks about the brevity of life. Look at verses 6 and 7. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. How quick these things work. Our lives are brief. And so Job makes the appeal to the Lord. He goes, Lord, I know that my life is brief. I know that this is not going to last very long, but help me. Help me to understand. In verses 11 to 21, the nature uh, of his suffering the bitterness of life that we go through. There's not any of us who doesn't look back on some time of our life or some experience that was hurtful, painful, and left us maybe tempted to be bitter. But God wants us to be better. Verse 11, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Prayer is powerful. And our prayer should allow us to express all of our emotions, our feelings to God. But we must not blame God. We must not uh, let our feelings draw a false conclusion. Keep looking to God, but be honest with Him. Look down at the closing verses here in verses 17 to 21. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? How long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target, so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. What powerful words as Job lays open, lays bare his heart, his soul to God. But again, 
He speaks honestly to God, but he continues to trust in God. God is able. In Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. There's a wonderful psalm that we often sing, It is well with my soul. H.G. Spafford, in 1873, he was a businessman in Chicago, and he planned a wonderful trip in the, in the fall for his wife and his four daughters. His young girls were from 12 down to 18 months. At the last minute, H.G. Spafford's business kept him in Chicago, and he kissed his wife and, and girls as they went off on this voyage. They were on the French vessel, the H.H. Uh, via de Havre, and they set sail. Somewhere off the coast of Newfoundland, they ran into an English vessel, Loch Urn, and it tore a, a hole in the side of that vessel, and the ship sank within 20 minutes. The three older daughters disappeared from his wife, Anna, as she held the 18-month-old for as long as she could, and finally the waves ripped uh, the youngest daughter away from her. She was rescued by a lifeboat sometime later, it was several days before they were able to reach uh, England. She wired her husband and said, saved alone. She was all by herself. Spafford came over to Europe to be joined to his wife. Later, as they sailed back to America, as they were there over the spot where that French vessel had gone down, the captain of the ship said, Mr. Spafford, it was right about here that your daughters drowned. He stood there. And he said, and he repeated it many times, it is well with my soul. Imagine the tremendous heartache of losing four children, but Spafford was able to say, it is well with my soul. His faith in God was greater than any of the events or tragedies that he had experienced in his life. And I would encourage you, keep your faith in God. We'll continue to look at this cycle of speeches and Job's somewhat helpless friends as we continue uh, next week. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.